Paintball Nerd. All right, today's guest on Paintball Nerd's Fun 5 is a bona fide paintball legend. He started on Out of Control, which is the pre-cap team. He joined the Ironman in 1996. He played with him for 15 years. He's got three World Cup victories. He's been head of R&D and gun design at Dai for 20 years. He's the senior designer of the DM guns. Ladies and gentlemen, the one and only Billy Wing. How you doing, hey. Billy? How's it going? What's what's up? What uh, you know, what's new and exciting? You know, that's that's my line. What's new and exciting? You 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 took that for me. It's almost like we <laughs> spent a lot of time together. <laughs> yes, dude. You uh, some people would say that you took me under your wing. I, I've heard that that term before. Yes. You know, you taught me how to tune an autococker. Yeah, yeah, that's what that's what it started. Putting uh, autococker parts together for the die cockers. That's right. Yeah, yeah. I was polishing sears and ram pistons, and putting O-rings on three-way shafts, <laughs> bending actuator rods. That's right. Jeez, that was a long time ago. In that little yeah. that little room off to the side. Yeah, that's crazy. Yeah. Those were uh, those are, those are very fond memories for me though. No, that was we had our own little world in that room. You know, no one really bothered us except for every couple of weeks. You know, Brian or somebody would would come down and be like, "What? We're just building guns that are made of a thousand little parts. It takes a while." <laughs> you know? It's where you invented the quiet barrel. Did I invent the quiet barrel? Did I get? I feel like you invented the quiet barrel. I, I who knows. My grumpiness might have. I might have been grumpy and be like, these things are too loud. I'm... <laughs> Dude, you got me on the Ironman. I think you, you got did. yourself on the Ironman, my friend. Well, I like to give you credit. You know? I appreciate that. But I think your exceptional cleanliness, even after playing X-Ball, was really the deciding factor. <laughs> I don't know how you stayed so clean all the time. Yeah, I, no, I think it was, it was definitely you. Because I remember you told Rich, I was I was sitting there. You're like, He's, he's small and fast and uh, he's sneaky and we should pick him up. But I, it, that was a lie because I wasn't fast. I was never fast. But it worked. You got me on the team. Nice. Yeah. That's, you know, it's much like picking up girls. You just, just lie and eventually it'll, <laughs> you know, it'll all work out. <laughs> We've got a lot of memories together. Yeah. A little bit of Taiwan time. Amsterdam. Yeah. Yeah, Amsterdam. Where else? Where else? Did we go? Where else? did we go to France together? No, I didn't make it to France. But I'll tell you, some of my most favorite memories are um, playing Seven Man. Actually, yes, I actually there is there is a game against Strange oh. in Denver. Or no, was it Strange? I think it was Strange. Yeah, in Denver, Seven Man. That just it always pops up in my head because it was like you, me, and one other guy against like five of them, and we whittled them down. And I, I shot Carthy out of the my mirror corner, and I took off. I took off, and it you know it was on turf, on like a slip slid over slid the bunker I was going for. Somehow didn't get shot, and then I collected myself, looked up, and you had bunkered like the last two guys was good in the flag. I was like, "Well, that worked out well." I just yeah, dude, I remember. I, I think about that game. I dream about that game actually. What's that? I dream about that game, like it because it was we were down to like one minute. Yeah, and we yeah, pulled it, it out really, really low on time. Yeah, that was yeah. We who else? We had uh, oh, we was Saransky and Todd and Poopy were on the team at that time, so that was a good crew. That was a lot of fun. Everyone took that it seriously, but just still had fun all the time. Yeah. So, yeah. yeah and, that was uh, good Huntington stuff. Beach, Seven Man. We were playing semi pro, you know, which kind of takes away from it a little bit for me. But yeah. We killed it, you know? No, that was another great game where uh, Ar Arsenal, maybe? What was it? Another. I remember that game clearly. You were up in front of me in this goofy long snake with. 10, 10 stand-ups in it, and we're like at a minute, you jump to the inside, go down, clear the guy, and I follow through. 
I get a concussion running into a ref. Yes. <laughs> like my head hurt for two days, three days after that. You smashed um, that guy. Yeah. Yeah. I, and you're shooting inside and just running like, cause I ran, I bunkered the guy, I bunkered the corner out and you were right behind me yeah. and just looking, you know, looking inside and then collided with this ref. Like I heard the impact. Yeah. And I, I was out of it cause it, there was, and Saransky went down the other tape, cleared out the 50 on that side. And it was just, I think it was maybe me and Robert Scott at the end. And there was one Arsenal guy who was in the back center and then he moved out to the far, you know, we call it the Dorito side corner. And I shot him like four different times and I was out of it. I was hurting, but I just, and so I wasn't like tight behind a bunker and he comes up and he just, he shoots me and then he like puts paint on Robert and I'm like, but he's got four hits on his pack. And they're like, no, 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 he's fine. And they gave him the win. I was like, what are you talking about? <laughs> well, we won that tournament. Oh yes, convincingly. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. So no, we won we won quite a bit together. It was fun. Yeah. Absolutely. And you've got a ton of memories before that. I mean, you've you've you know, I'm not gonna steal your thunder, but you know, so why don't you just tell me? You know, I think I know I think I know what the answer is, but oh memories? what is your favorite paintball memory? Jeez. Uh favorite paintball memories, you know, it, it's pretty it's pretty easy to go to the world cup wins. Uh, the first, the very first one, which was back in like 90, what was that? 99, 90, 98, 99. Uh, we're still playing. Cup? Yeah, that was 10 man. So I think we, we won the, I think we won the series too. Um, but that was, you know, that was a great one. Oh, wait. We win four World Cups. Yeah, I don't know that many. You lose count, right? I, I don't remember. I wish I did because <laughs> we won that one, and then we went back to back in uh, 07 and 08. Um, and so you know, all the that was the only three. Yeah, uh, you know, those are the easy ones. But there's obviously a little bit more special events. Uh, seven man in San Diego with you. Oh, we dude. we a throw together team complete. Let's see, it was you, me, and Catfish Paxton. from from Ironman. And then we had Paxton, Todd, and uh, Ryan from Shock. Mr. You. And then we had Pete. And then we had one other – oh, Robert Scott. So we had like three, three pro teams that just threw guys together. And we just – man, we <laughs> – we did damage. I think we only lost, I think we lost two matches the whole tournament. Yeah, and and what was really special is this is the first NPPL that they allowed NXL players to play, so everyone was playing yeah. that event. Yeah, yeah, you know, we played. You know, we had to beat out uh, the the top NX, uh, NF, huh, the top NPPL guys, and then you had you know the top NXL guys getting in there. The Russians uh, came over and played for Nexus at that event. Yep. Yeah, uh, you try to secure their spot. Uh, you know, it, we at the time um, excessive was a, a strong team. Um, we got to take their souls in the in the semis. Yeah, um, just it, one of those things that pop into my head is watching Thomas and Nikki Cuba and and several of the guys punching their bunkers as we shot them out. <laughs> just just getting so mad. Um, yeah, that was. That was a special one because it was a throw together team that nobody, nobody expected to do so yeah. good. So well, not only that, you know, playing playing against excessive, we, we kind of had a, a chip on our shoulder. I mean, you and I personally, because in two thousand four, yeah, right, all those guys left us, right? Yeah, they absolutely. left the Ironmen, and it was me, you, Catfish, Art Dela Cruz, and Eric Roberts left. Yeah, that was it. <laughs> Not much to work with. That was like yeah. we just rebuilding. So to play them on their turf, which you know that that's what it was. The seven man was was their turf. Yep. And uh, to play them in the in the semis and knock them out two games in a row. What did it go to a third? Uh, it did. I believe it went to a third. It did. Yeah. Yeah. But to knock them out, and then 
go play Oakland Assassins who were dominating in the NXL and just wipe them off the field. Yeah. That was your game. It was, that was, man, so many, so many good memories on that. You know, putting it like there's a, putting it together with Paxson against the, against the Assassins. Like, Hey man, when you're in that bunker, if I lean out, the, the corner guy just totally exposes himself to you. So I'll just bait him. And then you just blind shoot into the corner and you'll shoot him. I think we did that twice against the assassins. And it just, you know, Zach Long just walks out just riddled, you know. Yeah. And then the very last match, we shot like four of them off the break. Yeah. And the last mat, the last game was over in, I don't know, 30, 40 seconds. It was incredible. <laughs> yeah. That's available on YouTube. I, I found it. I I have uh I have it on DVD somewhere. It was the yeah, okay. San Diego MPPL. Someone released the whole thing on DVD. So yeah, that one's that's a special one, you know. Yeah. The, the, just the group of guys and and how fun it was and kind of how unexpected it was. You know, it's always fun being the underdog and and winning it. And you know, you know, we had jer- we had no names on our jerseys. We had no low team team names on our jerseys. We're using sharpies to write our team you know, our team motto on mantra. We tried to use the name Iron Man. Yeah, that was the thing. used it. Yeah, we yeah we just all we could be is the men. That's yeah. right. So yeah, that's definitely uh, my favorite memory, dude. Fond, fond memories. There's a lot of them, and you know, on the flip side of that, you, you start getting into the negative stuff and just the the petty po- politics of paintball over the years. It's just you know everyone fighting over pennies rather than yeah. working together. Really, you know, after 20, 30 years, you just shake your head and you're like, it's never going to change. We're, we're just here to, you know, short, short term, you know, now we're in this world of grow, I'm, I'm going to grow paintball. Like, eh, are you really growing paintball or are you just growing your paintball business? Cause yeah. you know, to really grow an industry takes sacrifice. And I don't see a lot of people making big sacrifices who are preaching the, the growth like that. So. Well, the industry right. is, is small, you know, we're all swimming in the same pool yes. and to kind of be wrestling in this same pool. It's like, you know, from an outsider's perspective, it's like, what are you guys doing? You know, why aren't you more united in helping the sport grow, getting more players into it? Um, but I think everyone's, you know, everyone in the business is first a paintball player and then a business person second. Absolutely. You know, yeah, so everyone's kind of striving for that upper echelon of business and making it. And it's kind of, I think it's kind of taken away from seeing like, hey, let's let's actually help this sport grow. Let's bring it back. Because it had, paintball had its shot. <laughs> it had a couple shots for sure. Yeah. So, but you know, it is what it is. And I mean, I, I might be throwing vague stones from a slightly a house with big windows in it. I don't know. I mean, I work for right. a big company, so I can't, yeah. I can't say too much. Yeah. <laughs> no, but you know, it's, it's true. And, uh, we, and all we do, all we want is, is a sport to grow. You know, we we're, we're in it, man. Yeah. No doubt. So Billy, Man, you've played with everyone. Right, you've played like, long, yeah. Players, yeah, yeah. I mean, I'm probably not going to make it choose one. I didn't make Saransky choose one. I'd like you to choose your favorite. I don't know if that's going to be possible, but who are some of your favorite players to play with, or just current players, just throughout the whole eons? Yeah, I mean, it could be it could be that they currently play. You could be that you've played with them. You could be it could be that you like watching them. Fair enough. Uh, Top top of the list, Shane Pistana. Mm. Uh, just truly probably embodies the purest heart and soul of paintball altogether. Yeah. The guy just just loves it. Just loves the camaraderie, the friendship, the competition, everything about it. He hates losing, but man, if you beat him straight up, like he's still got a smile on his face. Um, I mean, he in fact was the best man at my wedding, you know, so. Love the guy to death. Uh, other top guys, you know, it, for me, it really falls back on the maybe the generation or the half generation before me that the guys that kind of I was always like, man, it'd be cool to play with him. It'd be cool to play with that guy. So you're talking about, like you mentioned, Saransky, Todd Adamson, uh, you know, the Mal- Malachewski, Ryan Williams you know, um, some of those older guys that just, it was fun to get a chance to play a couple seasons with them. Uh, newer guys, 
you know, it, uh, there's a couple newer guys that I really enjoy watching. And, I, and newer is, let me rephrase that, current players, because yeah. they're not new. No, there's they're not hardly anybody new left in the sport. Uh, Greenspan's just always fun to watch. Um, Tyler Harmon's become really fun to watch. Um, uh, you know, uh, I enjoy uh, on Red Legion, Leo Smotroff. He, he lived with me for about six months. Uh, so it's always just fun to watch him play because he's like he's like my little brother now. Mm-hmm. So uh, stuff like, you know, those guys. But, um, you know, there's a big gap in there where you talked about I played with a lot of guys. Yeah, a lot of those guys were, you know, rookies or first, second year guys playing on the Ironman where, and I, I don't want to sound conceited or jaded or anything, but at the time that I played with them, it was like, yeah, you're the next kid. Come on. We just, <laughs> come on, let's see what you got. You know, and a lot yeah. of them became absolute phenomenal players, you know, Marcelo, Mouse, um, you know, Thomas, Thomas Telford, you know, the list goes on and on. Just, these guys who played for a couple seasons with the Ironman uh, and then moved on and, and played you know, Nikki Cuba. He, Nikki Cuba was special before he even played on the team. And I, I just want to make sure I don't forget his name because I consider him a good friend and he was, if anything, one of the, the best teammates you could have. Uh, hmm. So, but I mean, the, it's an endless list of guys. Uh, yeah. It's hard to pick. It's hard to narrow it down. Right. Yeah, but you you ultimately you'd probably find that they're all West Coast guys because you know <laughs> I was, that's where I'm from, and I didn't really put a lot of energy into meeting East Coast people. It yeah, just, they're on eh, whatever. <laughs> so. Yeah, I, I was talking with uh, Billy Saransky about Mare Island and all the names that came out of Mare Island, and that's that's the camp that you grew up in. Yeah, yeah, Northern California. I mean, you, even to this day. West Coast players, there's just more and more top top tier players coming from the West Coast, or or they're not they're not they want to be top tier, and they know they got to basically move to the West Coast, Southern California, to find a way in. Uh, you know, and that's it's a little unfortunate that that's somewhat of the fastest route to playing the pros is you know kind of routing yourself through. Southern California to this, to this day, even, even some of the Midwest teams and the guys who come up Midwest and the East coast really to be a, become a name. They have to kind of end up on an East coast or a West coast team, you know, get picked up, you know, travel, do whatever to, to be able to be a, a name that they can actually have some stock and trade and, and, and work their way up the ladder on the, on the teams. It's um, it, it's, it's, it's a sign that, you know, not to be go back to what we were talking about a minute ago, that as a paintball industry, we are not cultivating talent effectively across the U.S. And when you consider the, dare I say, political climate of California in general and what paintball is with guns and shooting at people, you probably would have a lot better success finding guys throughout the Midwest and in states and areas that have a slightly more gun friendly mindset <laughs> to, yeah. to play paintball. Um, but you know, California is the capital of entertainment. So, you know, it, it, it does make sense that that's kind of the, one of the meccas, you know, and it's been like that since the early nineties. Yeah. So. Yeah. You know, here I moved to Tennessee and, and, here paintball isn't as big. And I think that, I think that pro paintball, like an avenue to a professional team has a lot to do with people getting excited about continuing to play. You know, you're still going to have walk-ons. You're still going to have private groups and bachelor parties and all that, um, that, that sustain a paintball field. But as far as paintball being well known, it doesn't happen without there being a competitive professional environment. Uh, And, and the fact that, Southern California has, has, you know, a bunch of pro teams. I think that's what makes it, uh, that's what makes it grow. That's what makes it exciting. And that's what keeps kids playing is, you know, they look up to that. They want to be that. Oh, without uh, question. I mean, it's, 
you've seen it repeat itself several times in the last, you know, 10, 20 years where you'll get a team like uh, Omaha Vicious, right? Who, whoever, before Omaha Vicious, paintball in Omaha was nothing, yeah. you know, relatively speaking, on a, on a national right. level. And then you had Vicious for three or four years, and they built up a huge, you know, camp uh, and draw of players playing competitive paintball, tournament paintball. And as soon as Vicious went away, that just fizzled out. And right now you've, you're seeing it with LVL in Ohio. Ohio has yeah. been a big paintball state for a long time recreationally. And you've had little blips of, of tournaments, you know, competitive tournaments teams and stuff, but not until LVL really got, got in there and was committed to being a pro team. You know, you now see just a, big influx and a big increase of competitive players, you know, tournament type players coming out, coming out of Ohio. And that, that, uh, you know, tournament paintball in Ohio just keeps getting bigger because it has that focal point, that draw, you know, that local team to look up to how, you know, however you want to look at it, you know, and I would love to see somehow some way where every pro team was incentivized to, to do that. You know, but the way it's structured now, it's not, you know, it, it's yeah. just not, you know, the pro teams kind of cherry pick from the other pro teams and you've got, you know, this, that, and the other that kind of limit or, or even less than incentivize pro teams to cultivate their own talent internally or locally. It's just not, it's not beneficial to, them. you know, you might get one kid here, one kid there. Um, you know, the league as a such is kind of built up where it's just next team up. Yeah. Just turn, <laughs> chew them up, spit them out. Well, who's the next team that we're going to throw into the pro division? You know, maybe they'll stick. Yeah. You know, it's just, it's always rolling over. Um, so. I think that that paintball has the necessary ingredients to make something like that happen. You know, if you look something at like, at like the BKI school, you know, picture and imagine you had BKIs in every territory and that's where pro teams got their players, like some somewhat of a draft or something like that. And, and if paintball works together, they have the ability to organize that. They have the ability to make uh, a paintball school, you know, paintball training and to, to foster people up through the ranks in paintball and then make a draft, you know, make it happen. And, um, you know, like I said, we have the ingredients, but I think that everyone kind of focusing on like, this is my business and this is what I use to support my family and I need to make the, I need to make the dollar. I think that kind of prevents it from that, well, who's going to control it all. Right. Yeah. Well, and, and I mean, you're right. It would be nice to, it, you need to, it'd be nice to create some sort of pyramid structure, but yeah. when your top league, the, the, the premier league in the world, isn't a league it's an invitational because after the week after world cup i mean impact could be like eh, we're done you know the benefactors son's done playing and there's you know there's no financial return in this uh team's done yeah you know uh, you know look at teams you know there's teams that come and go all the time where it's it's a group of friends that come up they they play through the divisions uh they get they get up to the pro division the last three or four years and kind of as a group, they go, eh, it's time to grow up. And the team's gone. So yeah. I think really, you know, ultimately you'd have to create as a, a true league where the, the, the teams there, like any other professional sport are a, li a, a living entity of their own, not just they come and go and there's a whole team is replaced so that, you know, if there is some sort of financial, incentive that 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 team had actual true value return on investment of some sort then that team would be incentivized to con have a continuous rollover of talent you have your senior senior guys your journeyman guys and your rookies because you're constant just like any other professional sport you'd be you know you have to roll over your your talent and your your roster over so many years so you're always cultivating and building up and then you know you would then have that the tip of the pyramid and then the teams would be more incentivized to get their local their local talent build their local talent those teams you know but 
you're getting into some pretty heavy lifting because then you would have to structure the league so that you wouldn't have basically you'd have to basically have like salary caps for the teams. You'd have to create where, um, you know, teams couldn't just take players at will from the lower divisional teams. The so teams could actually protect their talent that they've cultivated stuff like that. And that's, I, I've, you're getting into, you probably need a player's union, collective bargaining stuff, which I, I heard is pretty hard to do, <laughs> you know, but you know, if you had a real league, then those top teams, professional teams, would be incentivized to pull players from regional areas to the national events, and then that would help fund the national events. Then you'd probably be able to get the team, the pro teams, to then they would be your focal point for the regional tournament series. So then it'd be they're just you'd have this pyramid that was every step down and every step up would be incentivized to push players to the national level. Right now you've got solved you know, it. What's that? You've solved it. What? No, I've, I could, I could write it out on a whiteboard, but that's a lot of legwork and probably a lot of money. And you'd probably have a league that would have to lose, truly lose money for maybe five to seven years to get this fully implemented. And I don't, I don't know if anyone's got the, the pocket depth in paintball to, to lose that much money and to, and to invest that much time into creating a true league. You know, you, you would talk, you'd have to talk about the top three or four teams that play players, that they'd probably have to cut their roster in half and limit their, their, their salaries. And then they would probably have to take some of that money and, and give it to other teams so that they could have, you know, a well-rounded roster and stuff like that. It, it gets real messy real fast, you know? Yeah. Uh, yeah, I mean, unless we all work together, you know, if there's if there's masterminds where the heads of industry meet and actually talk about this and say, hey, how how actually are we going to do this and have conversations like this? Um, you know, if, if we're serious about growing the sport, you know, conversations like this should be on the table. Right. And and coming up with solutions, even if it does involve a bunch of money. But, you know. Everyone pools their resources and figures it out. It could be bigger than it's ever been. It'd be nice. It would be. I'll just keep playing yeah. in my little shop back here. <laughs> yeah, you got a bunch of stuff back there. What are you What are you working on back there? Uh, right now, it's we're kind of wrapping up all the projects for World Cup. Uh, you know, so I've got since I live, you know, thirty minutes from uh, the World Cup site. Uh, this time of year, stuff gets shipped directly to my house, so it's just kind of piling up all the. I've got several boxes of brand new product that no one's seen, no one's heard of, just sitting mm. on my in my back uh, back porch. Um, but you know, final testing, you know, checking off samples, talking to uh, our factories almost nightly. Just that's what I've been working on mostly. Um, we actually have quite a bit of new stuff that, that we get to release at World Cup. Uh, I'm really oh. excited about. Can you can you tell us about any of it? I can't because. I mean, I would, I want to, but then, yeah. you know, that's not how we do things at die. <laughs> yeah. Well, go to, go, go to world cup. And then, you know, we can see what, what die is, uh, die's releasing. Yeah. I, I will, I will say that some, some of the stuff we're doing, uh, I, all of it I'm proud of, but we've really in the last about five years, we, we, we die as a company has committed and made a, a shift in our, our focus, which is, working within the industry, working with people outside industry to make the best products. Uh, you know, we, we've kind of taken, tried to take a more humble position that although we've been doing it for 20, 30 years, mm. there's people with fresh ideas that we need to listen to that mm -hmm. have unique and um, valuable designs that, that are worth getting to market that maybe by the, that, that by themselves, they can't do it, but we can work with them to get the best products to, to the customers. Um, so we've got a lot of collaborative stuff that we've worked on. Uh, and then we we're still very focused on, on innovation, you know, actually doing something new. Uh, you know, I think, I think it's kind of gotten lost in the annals of history, but Dai has been pretty good at, at releasing new ideas and new technology and, and really pushing 
designs, not just recycling or rehashing the same thing over and over again. Um, you know, we've got our staples and our standards, but, you know, you look at, you know, the, even back in the day, the NT, that was pretty unique and different. Yeah. Um, you know, stuff like that. The rotor was pretty unique and different. I you love know? the rotor. Who doesn't? Like, especially for mech. Yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. So um, our mech frame that we just released for the DSR, it's it's got a trigger system that no one's seen before. You know, it's got a it's got a, a self timing analog dwell. Uh, you know, it's got a trigger bypass that decouples the bolt from from the trigger assembly, so that you know the gun does a full and complete cycle no matter what you do to the trigger. You know, it's almost yeah, like sure. a you you if you try really hard and you want to, but you know, this is the first week that the frames have been out to the public, and more and more videos are coming out, and guys are right out of the box are shooting. 12, 15 balls a second with the thing, you know, cause, and, and they're not having hiccups with paint feeding or anything. Cause the gun, once they initiate the cycle, the bolt, it, it just goes. So we're pretty happy with that, but there's, there's a couple of things coming out at world cup that are very innovative, um, that are not recycled or copied or anything from our, within our own portfolio stuff or from someone else's portfolio stuff. Uh, you know, other industry companies, uh, you know, it's unique. You know, I think, I think more and more the, the, the industry is kind of plateaued and you see guys, other companies kind of, Ooh, new milling, taking a lot of, a lot of ideas from each other and then saying it's something new and different mm. that's been out for seven to 10 years. You know? Yeah. So uh, we're we're really committed right now to to doing new, pushing new, not just recycling, you know, or taking you know old ideas and making them new, even though they're so old. <laughs> That's exciting, man! I can't I can't wait to see what you guys come out with uh, at World Cup. Yeah, I, I think it'll be fun. It'll be a good it'll be a good uh, event for us. So. Cool, man. Well, when, when I think of you on the field, Billy, I think of, well, I, th I think of a couple things. I think of a visor always. <laughs> I think of an angle drop forward. Of course. Um, so <laughs> what would you say, maybe I just named them, but what would you say are the items you can't be on the field without? Uh, the visor. I've gotten so used to wearing a visor uh, because it just, I see better. Like it puts a shadow. I don't get reflections from the inside of the lens. Uh, it has nothing to do with anything goofy. That's truly the main reason. I, I, I never get a reflection coming through the vents and giving me lines on the inside of my lens. Uh, so the visor, I don't really use a drop for it anymore because the guns don't accommodate for them really. Um, so I not necessarily need that. Uh, past that, yeah, I mean, I could say a whole bunch of different equipment, but really they all have die logos on them for obvious reasons. So, <laughs> so did you yeah. stop playing competitively because you can't put a drop forward on a gun anymore? Pretty much. <laughs> yeah, that, was, that was it. Dave sat me down and said, "No more drop forwards," and I was like, "Well, then, then I I'm done." And he's like, "Yeah, okay, it's about time." <laughs> you know, you can make you have the capability. Billy Wing to make a custom grip frame that has an angle bottom line. You could do it. I I did make one for fun a few years ago. There you go. I figured you would. <laughs> yeah, why not, right? So, but uh, no, I stopped playing because my knee was my knee was done, and I was old enough, and it was time to grow up and stop being Peter Pan. To be honest, so yeah, being Peter Pan's fun though, right? It's addicting. It's addicting, um, you know, but uh, there's a lot more important things than just running around basically having like five to 10 high school reunions a year with your paintball buddies. Yeah. That's, kind of, that's kind of what it feels like. So, um, you know, when I was living in San Diego and Pacific Beach, you know, you kind of get caught in a time loop where you just don't get old. You don't, right. you're just stuck at that. 20 something year old age. And, uh, you know, at some point you kind of go, eh, I, 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 
<laughs> the people I'm hanging out with and that I go to the bars and see look really, really young now. That's probably not a good sign. I need to change what I'm doing. <laughs> so, so yeah. yeah. So then we went and started going up to La Jolla. Um, that helped a lot. The a little older crowds, so I felt more comfortable. For a yeah. Few years. <laughs> <laughs> so Billy, man, you've got a ton of memories here. You've got a lot to be thankful for. Certainly. What do you, you know, as far as what paintball has given you in life, what are you most thankful for? Uh, man, perspective. Uh, if, if I could perspective and just kind of that, that competitive focus determination that you kind of cultivate playing at a high level, that there's, there's always a way to win. There's always a way to accomplish what you want. Uh, that, that has served me very well in just about every aspect of my life outside of paintball, just, mm. you know, I'll find a way, you know, you know, you, you play in a field, the field layout that's horrible. You can't just be like, well, I'm not going to just play this field layout. Like you've got to find a way to be competitive and try to win, you know? So that, that was a big part of it that I could apply to everything that I'm very appreciative of. And then uh, as far as perspective in general, uh, all the traveling we, we've done, uh, especially the international travel, uh, you know, you kind of, you kind of live in a bubble uh, in the U S uh, just what you see, what you think is normal, what you think is st standard around the world. Uh, and you travel outside that world. It's, and if you travel, you can travel a lot and go to resorts and country clubs and stuff like that all over. But you're, those are just extensions of the, the bubble of the United States. And, you know, when you travel down to South America and you're you know, you're driving around in a bulletproof car with armed guards to go to the <laughs> nicest restaurant in the city because it's not safe. You realize that this is, this is more what the world is used to than what we are used to in America. Yeah. And just having that perspective that what you think is normal is, is probably not the case for, you know, 70, 80% of the population in the world. Right. So uh, the perspective that, being super fortunate in the situation and, you know, just everything where I'm at uh, makes it really easy to just always have a good attitude every morning. Like it <laughs> could be a lot worse, <laughs> you know, no matter I mean, what. Absolutely. You know, we're traveling around the world shooting, you know, paint filled gel caps at each other and yeah. someone it's on someone else's dime. So, you know, yeah. Talk about privilege, right? Oh, absolutely. You know, and I, I don't think it's, uh, how do I, what's the word I'm looking for? It's not just entitled privilege. I think the guys who travel and get to shoot the paintballs and go pew, 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 they've earned it because they're very good at it and they're dedicated and committed to being you know, a top level player. But at the same time, like that opportunity that that sport, this sport even exists and there's enough competition and enthusiasm for it across the world is is pretty amazing and special that, yeah. you know, and I, my, probably my favorite part about it is it's still at a very local level. You know, we're not talking about like NFL or, or premier soccer players or like, you know, formula one drivers or motor GP riders that when they travel, like they're just in this bubble. You know, when we, when we travel outside the U S or go anywhere internationally, we're, we're right there on ground level with, with the general population. We're not mm. carted off to the side and, and separated and, you know, treated differently. We're just, you know, you're staying in some not so nice hotel and maybe in a not so nice neighborhood of whatever city you're in, you know, just like, all right, this is everyday life here. You know, and it's a great, that's a great experience. Yeah. So Billy Wing, man, you've 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 reached the top in paintball competitively, obviously. You're at the top in industry. You know, there's kids that look up to you. There's adults that look up to you and say, you know, I want to make it there. What do you think it takes to get to that level? Man, uh, <sighs> there's a lot of luck involved. Uh, competitively, it's probably easier on a competitively to say like what it would take, which is 
you know, really a lot of sacrifice and dedication, a lot of focus and commitment, you know, in general, like anything you want to be successful at. Mm -hmm. And then the, the luck aspect is getting to know the right people, getting an in somewhere, you know, teams, most teams don't actively focus on cultivating and recruiting. So you really kind of got to have a foot in the door, get to know somebody local or commit to just relocating to where there's enough teams that you can play regularly against the top tier guys to get noticed. Hopefully, you know, that I was fortunate enough to live in Northern California where the Ironman constant pursuit, you know, um, some of these, you know, old school teams played and, you know, even more fortunate that I lived in the hometown of Daryl Trent and worked at the paintball shop that he came and hung out at two or three times a week, you know? And so he got to know me. And then when I started shooting two or three Ironmen on the weekends, he'd be like, Hey, we need to, you know, Bob, Shane, Brian, start, start watching this kid. Like I, I know him. I talk to him every week. He's a good kid and he's starting to shoot him. And, you know, I, I remember having the stories with, you know, Shane and Brian and, you know, Clayton and some of the old guys. And they're like, shut up, Daryl. He's not shooting us. He's like, no, start paying attention. You know, <laughs> and about a, three, three weeks later, you know, all of a sudden Shane's coming over being friendly. Brian's coming over being friendly. Cause I knew Daryl, I got, I got Daryl to know who I was, not that that was intentional, but then Daryl noticed because he knew who I was. Mm -hmm. And he was the guy who said, Hey, start paying attention to this kid. Cause at that level, they're like, whatever, it's just a kid in the bushes, you know? Yeah. So you really, if you're not in an area, uh, a hot spot for paintball, sometimes it takes just, you have to commit to going there. Uh, that's, that's tough. As far as on an industry level, that's even harder. Um, you the, probably the first thing you got to do is be willing to work for less than what you think you're worth. Cause Paintball, there's not as much money in paintball as anybody thinks. Mm -hmm. uh, most companies are, man, we're, from one month to the next with, with selling product, there's not, a, we don't have deep war chests to dip into. Uh, and you got to be talented at what you do. And again, a lot of it's knowing, knowing somebody. Um, and I, man, I mean, I'd like to say that there's schooling and stuff that's important, but hell, I barely graduated high school. You know, I can, I can, bar <laughs> I could barely read. And I certainly can't write, spell and write to save my life. So, <laughs> but you know, um, I'm very mechanically minded and pretty handy. So that, that served me well. So I can't say that education is a big part of it. You know, I kind of learned as I went. Yeah. Got to give uh, a lot of thanks to Dave and, and Rhonda Die that, you know, they let me learn by trial and error a lot. You know, and I definitely made some mistakes. And as long as I was honest and owned up to them, they're like, all right, well, you know, just work late, fix the problem you made. And, you know, like, just we'll keep going. <laughs> you yeah. know, so, um, yeah, I, you just if you really want it, it's going to take sacrifice. No one's going to give, give anything to you. It's yeah. So, and the, the love demand, it. yeah, the demand of, of being in the sport and in the industry is a lot higher than the supply of opportunities. So you're yeah. going to have to fight for it. Awesome. Billy, man, thank you so much for your time here today. Is there anything that you'd like to part with for the paintball community? Part with for the paintball community. Um, it's important to be, accept your inner nerd yes. and join the nerd herd. I think that's important. <laughs> I think that that is something we all need to accept that I think too many nerdy paintball players uh, don't accept about themselves. We're just huge paintball nerds, every one of us. I agree, man. 100%. <laughs> Dude, thank you so much. Thank you for your time. You're very welcome, man. It was good talking to you. Take care. Later. Bye.